So um, hey, let me title this as a, a complex exponential representation of trig functions. So this is an um, inverted version of Euler's formula. So in Euler's formula, this is what you've seen, that um, if you have a, a complex exponential, e to the i theta, then this can be broken down and written as uh, cosine of theta plus i sine theta. And um, this is something you might have seen in pre-calculus. And, um, and after having taken calculus two, which is a prerequisite to physics 4b, uh, you should be able to actually prove this using Taylor polynomial. Um, so, um, so I'll, I'll take this as a given that this is an expression that you are familiar with and um, that you at least uh, have seen this formula. Now, what I want to do is I want to represent the cosine of theta and sine of theta in terms of, um, in terms of complex exponentials. And I guess um, this is one of those cases where it's uh, easier for you to just see the formula first and then and see that it's true uh, as opposed to trying to drive this formula. So let me just to write it down. This is the complex exponential representation of cosine theta. So cosine theta can be written this way, e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta, and then I have to divide it by two. Um, if you have never seen this, uh, let me show you that this equality here is true. Um, it, so the way to show it is let me just to write out the right-hand side and see what I get. So as I write out the right-hand side, I'm gonna use Euler's formula. So it's a cosine of theta plus I sine theta and then plus uh, cosine of, I guess, minus theta plus I sine minus theta, the whole thing divided by two. And this is where it's uh, very useful for you to know the properties of cosine and sine function. Cosine is an even function, meaning cosine of uh, minus of a parameter, it's actually same as cosine of just a parameter. So I can ignore this minus sign without any consequence. Um, I can do this because cosine is an even function. In a similar way, sine is an odd function, so I can pull out this minus sign, kind of. <laughs> so, so with those uh, modifications, uh, this is the expression you see. So I'm just imagining pulling out this minus sign so that it looks like this now. So you see that you can combine some terms. I can add the cosine theta terms together because now they are cosine of the same parameter and the sine terms uh, cancel out because it's the sine of the same parameter, but one with the minus sign and one without. So when you finish the calculation, I have two cosine theta divided by two. So yeah, the right-hand side is cosine of theta. And you can get similar rep representation for sine theta. The sine theta could be written as in this way. I, I think once you have seen this, then you might already have some inspiration for how to write sine theta in terms of uh, complex exponentials. So if you have it already, great. <laughs> if not, let me write it down, see if it makes sense. e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta. And I think I have to divide this by two. Wait, not two, two i. And I'll leave that up to you to show that this expression really is equal to sine theta. It goes through the similar calculation. What changes is before it was the cosine, before it was the sine term that canceled out with this change of sine here, it will be the cosine term that cancels out. And after sine terms, you add them together, you, this cancels out the factors that you don't want on the numerator. So 
So this is the complex exponential representation of the trig functions. And um, with this, you don't need any um, trig identities. This week's discussion had, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> tell me <laughs> something about trig identities. And, um, and I saw some examples from people and um, let me just uh, do, a, uh, do a few and to see how with uh, simply this information at hand and knowledge of exponential algebra that any calculation you might have done using trig identity, you can also do using this uh, complex representation of trig functions. Now, one mistake I made in the past semesters was that I was trying to derive uh, these identities using this, and that's a little bit harder. Uh, what is easier is to uh, uh, show that the identities hold. Like once you already know the identity, then you can prove it using the using this uh, representation. And the fact that you can prove it also means that you don't really need the identities themselves. Because if you simply go through the exponential algebra, you would get the same result anyway. So let me go through a couple of those examples. I guess, um, um, let me start out with something simple, <laughs> an identity that everyone knows, uh, the identity that um, that's basically the Pythagorean theorem. I don't know if it has any uh, better name than that, but it's this one that I'm thinking of. Identity that says cosine uh, squared of theta plus sine squared of theta is equal to one. I'm calling this Pythagorean theorem because that's kind of what it is. <laughs> if we have a vector R that has component uh, x and rx and ry, then rx squared plus ry squared is equal to r squared, and that kind of uh, comes from this. So, so, um, so let me prove that this is the case. Uh, you might have already seen a proof of a Pythagorean theorem that's uh, geometric and you know, uses all these things that you don't normally think about. I think the thing I remember was this one, uh, where inscribed right triangle or something. And I think we do this somehow, you could have proved that A squared plus B squared is C squared. Um, the thing about the geometric arguments are, they are clever, they are in some sense intuitive, but they are so difficult to, to come up with. It, it takes some smart person, a lot of cre creativity to come up with a particular geometry proof. The nice thing about algebra is that you just follow a set of simple rules step by step, and you don't really need a lot of creativity most of the times, and you get the right result. And that's the advantage of using these expressions here, that something that might have needed geometric reasoning you can get through by using purely algebra. So let me do it, do it here. Uh, I'm just gonna substitute in for cosine and sine, these expressions that we got for uh, cosine and sine. So let me do that. I have e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta divided by two. This is cosine theta. So let me say that this thing squared. So that's a cosine theta squared plus let me write down the uh, sine theta squared e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta. And the, here I'm just following all the rules of algebra strictly. I'm not doing any complex conjugate stuff uh, because really um, this thing that I've written, if you say this is f of theta, f of theta is cosine theta. So even though this uh, expression has uh, eyes appearing all over the place, it's a, uh, it's a real function. So I shouldn't have to, um, so I'm not taking any complex conjugate. I'm not doing anything that, um, that you haven't heard of. So let me go through the algebra. Um, so um, uh, so squ squaring the first uh, part, uh, term, it's a matter of expanding out the, uh, um, it's expanding out this expression e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta times e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta. So let me do that 
down here. Um, so the first the terms together, that's e to the um, two i theta. It, it, I'm skipping some steps. You know, it's a, it's the e to the i theta times e to the i theta, and when you add the exponents together, this is what you get. Um, do let me know if uh, any step sign skipping uh, is causing confusion so that I can slow down and explain the steps. Um, and uh, let me multiply these two terms that also gives me e to the minus two i theta. And then I'm going to handle the cross terms. There's this term times this, that's going to give me e to the i theta times e to the minus i theta. So that's gonna be one. Uh, so that's one, and this term times this, that's gonna actually give me the same value, e to the minus i theta times e to the i theta, that's one. So those terms added together, I have plus two. So that's the first uh, square. Let me write down the, the second square term. This time I'm gonna do most of this in my head. I have the first term squared, so it's gonna be e to the uh, two i theta. I have the second term squared by itself. It's minus e to the minus i theta times itself. So it's going to be plus e to the minus 2i theta. And then I have the cross terms. That's the product between the first and the second term. And there's two of those. And I get, so that's minus 1 for one of them, you know, plus e to the i theta times minus e to the i minus i theta. The exponents cancel out, but I have plus 1 times minus 1. So it's minus, there are two of those, so minus two. The denominator, I have to be a little careful here. It's, uh, uh, oh wait, I spotted a mistake. This should have been two squared. So uh, two squared is four. Uh, I have two i squared and that's uh, um, two squared times i squared. i squared is minus one, so it's minus four. All right, I, I got some simplifications to do. Let me do it here. I'm gonna pull out this minus sign out front here so that it's super easy to miss the minus signs in the denominator. So I want to make sure I don't miss that. So with this minus sign here, I can kind of see what terms will cancel. I have e to the two i theta divided by four. I have minus e to the two i theta divided by four. That's gonna cancel. I have the same thing happening with the second terms. They're gonna cancel. So I have two minus minus two or plus two divided by four. So that gets me uh, four over four or one. So that's one identity proven. I started out with the left-hand side and I got to the right-hand side here. So that's simple enough. And uh, let me show you Hmm. Do I have time for two more identities or let me do just one. And I think once I've done one, the other one would be other one. You can kind of follow the same reasoning. And I think it, it would be good practice for you to so I'll leave that for you. So the other trig identity that I say is one of the most useful in physics is the angle addition formula. Uh, and I think that's the one I was trying to prove in the video, but the way I was going about it wasn't really the right way. So these are the angle addition formulas. Uh, this is how I usually remember it. Cosine of alpha plus minus beta is equal to cosine alpha cosine beta minus plus sine alpha sine beta. And there's a version for sine sine of alpha plus minus beta is equal to sine alpha cosine beta uh, plus minus sine beta and cosine alpha. I probably don't have time to work out both of them. So I could probably do sine. So let me just uh, pick sine and go with that. And uh, this is where I do have to be a little bit careful um, in that. So starting from the left-hand side, I won't be able to really derive the right-hand side as I apparently did here. Um, the expression for the right-hand side, it's quite complicated and I'm not gonna be able to just uh, magically get to that. But what I can do is I can write down a um, complex exponential version of the left-hand side write down a complex exponential version of the right-hand side. And through a series of simplifications, I can show that they simplify to a form that are equivalent to each other. 
So that's what I mean, uh, just uh, proving the identity. So if I didn't already know the identity, then, um, then you know, I can't drive it. So I can make up for lack of the knowledge of the identity itself there. But what I'm showing there is that whatever calculation it was that would have needed this identity, I could simply do the same calculation using the exponentials and exponential algebra. I didn't have to know the identity itself for, for whatever simplification it might have helped with. So let me write down the left-hand side. So sine of alpha plus minus beta in terms of the complex exponentials. So I'm kind of remembering the formula from before. E to the i times the angle. Um, yeah, I guess I'm gonna keep plus minus throughout the whole thing. Uh, alpha plus minus beta. Oh, and minus e to the minus i, alpha plus minus beta divided by two i. Okay, so that's the expression for sine. Uh, let me do a little bit of simplification um, so that at least uh, these things are all separated out. So I can uh, distribute i into this uh, parenthesis thing. And one of the rules of exponential algebra is that if you have e to the a plus b, then that's equal to e to the a times e to the b. So I'm going to write it out that way. So I have e to the i alpha times e to the plus minus i beta minus e to the minus i alpha times e to the, I guess, minus plus i beta divided by 2i. And I think that's where I'm going to have to leave it. I don't see any obvious way it would look simpler than how it appears now. So let me put a pause here for the left-hand side. And let me look at the right-hand side. I can write this out in terms of um, the, the complex exponential and see what I can simplify and see if through a series of simplification steps, I can get an expression that I can look at and say, oh, that looks exactly like this. Left-hand side and right-hand side are equal to each other. So, um, so the right-hand side, let me just write down this as a reminder. It's gonna take a little bit of time just to writing things down. I remember, uh, was it a pro physics professor or math professor who said that his hand um, knows algebra better than his hand, his head. Sometimes um, it's a matter of writing things down and it takes time to write them down. But uh, once you write it down, then you can see how things might simplify. So. Let me do that. Um, I'm just gonna write out each term one at a time. So I have e to the i alpha minus e to the minus i alpha divided by two i. So that's this done. This multiplies to cosine of beta. So e to the i beta plus e to the minus i beta divided by two. Okay, that's done plus minus um, e to the i beta minus e to the minus i beta divided by 2i times e to the i alpha plus e to the i minus i alpha divided by two. All right, so the thing to do is to expand the things out, hope that some things cancel out, and hope that things don't cancel out that we'll, we'll be able to find the counterparts on the left-hand side. So I'm just doing the product. First term times the first term. That's a e to the i alpha times e to the i beta. Oh, and, and the first term times the, the second term is plus e to the i alpha times e to the minus i beta. The second term times the first term is, yeah, it's not gonna cancel out. I'm not that lucky. <laughs> minus e to the minus i alpha times e to the i beta. They don't cancel out because the exponents are different. 
second term times second term, I get minus e to the minus i alpha times e to the um, e to the minus i beta. Okay, that's the entire uh, t of the first product, that whole thing divided by uh, 4i. Okay, let's keep going. I have the second term. Um, so second term is gonna be plus minus. Mm, somehow this plus minus uh, has to get transferred over to the exponent. Uh, we'll see how that happens. E to the i beta times e to the i alpha. Let me do a little favor to myself and I'm gonna order them so that alpha comes before beta. So it, that product is gonna be e to the i alpha times e to the i beta. The first term times the second term is gonna be plus e to the minus i alpha times e to the i beta. The second term times the first term is gonna be minus e to the i alpha times e to the minus i beta. The second term times second term is gonna be minus e to the um, minus i alpha times e to the minus i beta. The whole thing divided by four i. All right, uh, do some things cancel? Oh, you know what? I think which terms cancel depends on this sign here. I think that's uh, how I'm gonna get the <laughs> plus or minus in the exponent. So let me work out a couple scenarios. So the scenarios here is, let me take the case when uh, it's plus. So when it's a plus, then the scenario I have is the, these two terms will add, this term will get canceled out by this term here. This will get canceled out by this term here. I'm trying to make sure that the exponents are the same. And this term will add to that term, okay. So in that first case scenario, I have e to the i two, e to the i alpha times e to the i beta. And then the last term minus e to the minus i alpha times e to the minus i beta divided by four i, oh, and this is also two. So the two cancels out and I get two i in the denominator. And um, this is the scenario that matches up if I had a, um, so if I had a, this upper possibility plus here and minus here, that's number one. Let me write out number two. So with the minus sign here, it changes <laughs> which terms cancel. So I'm gonna have um, this term being canceled out by this because with this minus sign, they are they are having the same sign means they'll cancel out. So e to the i alpha minus e to the, so this will add to this term to get me two, uh, two of the same thing. This term will add to this term to get me minus two of the, same thing, and this term will cancel out with the last term here. So in that second scenario, I have the, um, the terms that are not canceling out, two e to the i alpha times e to the minus i beta. And uh, this was the term that didn't cancel out and I get minus two um, e to the um, minus i alpha times e to the uh, plus i beta. So I'm just making sure I note that it's not. Uh, yeah, yeah, this was adding to this term. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, the whole thing divided by uh, 4i. Okay, so twos cancel out to get me 2i in the denominator. And if you compare the terms, this is what you get with the lower part of the sign, uh, minus i beta here and plus i beta here. So, so yeah, um, the right-hand side is equal to left-hand side in both of these uh, scenarios. So we've proven the uh, trig identity that's the angle addition formula for the sign. And it took a bit of time, you know, it's a uh, kind of lengthy algebra, but the, the upside is that it's uh, algebra. Uh, with algebra really, 
the trade that's rewarded is uh, attention to detail and not missing any symbols or signs, just going step by step slowly. And through all of these steps, I didn't really need to be creative about um, showing anything. And I, I, it's been a long time since I've read the proof of the angle addition formula. And I'm fairly sure the geometric proof is something that it takes so much creativity that I don't remember. I would have to look it up in a textbook. But approving it using complex exponentials, it's just following the exponential algebra. No creativity needed. You just follow the steps and you're done. Um, and what this is showing is that any calculation that might have needed this trig identity, if you simply turn whatever uh, trig expression you have into this uh, complex exponential uh, representation, then you can basically go through the steps that you might have gone through your trig identities. And at no point you can, you at no point you needed to bring up the trig identities themselves. You can just go through the exponential algebra, simplify it down as much as you can. And that will be the simplest expression possible within restrictions. So, so yeah, that's the, presentation of complex exponential representation of trig function. Oh, I guess that took a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, <laughs> doing, going through each of these calculations, it does take time. So, um, okay, so this tool is something that we are going to be using um, in the case of optics more by choice because um, some of the calculations we do, we could do it without introducing complex functions, but Complex exponentials really make a calculation easier. So I, I strongly encourage that to learn how to use it. And later on in the semester, when we get to quantum mechanics, that's where you needed to use complex functions anyway. And at that point, it's, uh, you know, things will be easier if you have uh, already some level of intuition with the complex exponentials. Because I think this is partly why I wanted you wanted to link you to, oh, I was already on the page. This is partly why I wanted to link you to these two chapters from uh, Feynman lectures. Because I think uh, imaginary numbers get a bad treatment in introductory math classes. The, the physical meaning of imaginary number is not something that that um, that's normally taught in a way where you are uh, encouraged to develop your intuition about those um, that imaginary portion. And um, I think the presentation you see here will um, it'll show you how how we use this complex number representation to describe the real world. Uh, which is really what we are doing in quantum mechanics. Oh, oh I uh, briefly mentioned how this uh, is the inspiration for hyperbolic functions. And um, I forget when I was taught hyperbolic functions. Um, so I don't know if you are supposed to have seen this already. Um, so, <laughs> so what I'm saying right now might be something completely new if it is. Don't worry about it. We don't use them in this class. Although um, you could use them in description of uh, description of special relativity. Um, but if you haven't heard of hyperbolic functions, it's these. Um, uh, it's uh, something called the Cauch, um, Cauch Ada, and Sinch Ada. These are hyperbolic functions, and they are defined this way: Cauch of some parameter is given as e to the parameter plus e to the minus parameter divided by two. And sinh eta would be e to the parameter uh, minus e to the minus eta parameter divided by two. You can kind of see how these are inspired by each of these. You get these by just getting rid of the <laughs> i. <laughs> and so, they, you know, there are different functions and there are contexts where uh, these are, and the properties involving these functions are uh, quite useful. Uh, they are called the uh, hyperbolic functions. And um, there are hyperbolic identities that are analogous to these trig identities.
but that's not something that uh, we ever use in this class, so we don't have to worry about that. Although we could, when we do special relativity, we could uh, have some representation of Lorentz transformation that uses this, but we don't need to, so we won't. <laughs>